Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're concluding our Prime Ministers of Shu Han Let's Talk Lore series with episode 3, titled Fei Yi. Before we get started, here's the answer to our trivia question from our previous episode, and as an added bonus, I also included the rankings of all 14 statues in case anyone was curious. Now last time we finished covering the life of Dong Yun, who as we mentioned, was a childhood friend of Fei Yi. As the two grew up together, sharing the spotlight as young and upcoming scholars within the Yi province. And speaking of Fei Yi's childhood, we have to mention that Fei Yi was orphaned from a young age, as he would be raised mostly by his uncle, Fu Boren, in the Jiangxia commandery of the Jin province. Now, when Liu Zhang took control of the Yi province after his father's death, Fei Boren and his clan was welcomed into the Yi province as esteemed guests because Fei Boren's aunt or Fei Yi's grand-aunt, was Liu Zhang's birth mother. So technically, Liu Zhang was Fei Yi's uncle. This connection afforded Fei Yi the best education possible, as he would become peers with the likes of Dong Yun and Xu Qin, who was the son of the famed scholar and first grand tutor of the kingdom of Han in Xu Jing. Of these three promising youngsters, Xu Qin would actually be the first one to die, as he would die of illness quite young, and due to the political station of his father, Xu Jing, there was a grand funeral planned for him where most of the political elites of Shu Han would be attending. As friends to the deceased, Dong Yun and Fei Yi naturally had to attend as well, but when Dong Yun asked his father, Dong He, for a carriage to bring them to the site of the funeral, Dong Yun was disappointed and ashamed by the run-down second-hand carriage with no rear covering that his father provided. As Dong He was famous for being incorruptible, and was thus very poor throughout his life. Fei Yi, however, didn't let the state of the carriage bother him as he volunteered to be the driver, sitting in the front for all to see, while Dong Yun sat uneasily in the back, embarrassed that he would be seen in such a poor carriage. And it was at this moment that Dong Yun's father, Dong He, made the offhanded comment that while he had always known that Fei Yi and Dong Yun were peers and equals when it came to their education, it was now clear that Fei Yi showed far superior character than his own son when it came to morality, virtues, and vanity. But as we mentioned before, both Dong Yun and Fei Yi would go on to become the crown prince attendants for Liu Shan, after Liu Bei declared himself as emperor, and then they were elevated to imperial attendants when Liu Shan ascended the throne in 223. Fei Yi's political career would take a turn in 225 when Zhuge Liang returned victorious from his Nanjun campaign down south against Meng Huo's rebellion, and as Zhuge Liang's carriage was riding up the street, officials from the Shuhan court were lined up on both sides welcoming his return. At that moment, Zhuge Liang asked Fei Yi, who was just a young junior official at the time, to join him in his carriage as Zhuge Liang wanted to entrust a key diplomatic mission to Fei Yi. And this became an important moment for Fei Yi because once he got onto that carriage, every official became jealous of him as it became clear that Prime Minister Zhuge Liang favored him. But the mission that Zhuge Liang would assign him would be no easy task as Zhuge Liang would promote him to a lieutenant role and send him out as a diplomat to Wu to speak with Sun Quan in order to repair relationships as a setup for Zhuge Liang's next plan, which was the preparation for the northern expeditions. Now, Fei Yi's first diplomatic mission to Wu turned out just as you would expect, with Sun Quan trying to drink Fei Yi to death in order to embarrass the Shu Han side, and with key officials such as Zhuge Ke trying to score political points with their pointed color commentary on the state of their diplomatic relationship. But despite all this, Fei Yi was able to keep decorum and made no major mistake, even whilst he was drunk from drinking with Sun Quan. And because of this experience, Fei Yi became an army advisor with Zhuge Liang's northern expedition forces in 227, as his main duty at the time was to be an envoy to Wu in an effort to coordinate attacks between the two sides, as Fei Yi would end up making many more trips between Hanzhong and Wu from 227 to 230. Another key function of Fei Yi within the northern expedition forces was as a mediator between the two rivals of Wei Yan and Yang Yi. Long before Zhuge Liang's death, Wei Yan, who was technically ranked as the chief military advisor of the Northern Expedition, along with all his previous general titles, was already at odds with the assistant prime minister in Yang Yi, due to personality clashes and disagreement over military philosophy. 
These disagreements eventually elevated to outright arguments and sometimes even physical confrontations as Wei Yan was recorded to have frequently pointed his sword at Yang Yi. And this was where Fei Yi came in, as Fei Yi got along with both Wei Yan and Yang Yi. So at war council meetings, Fei Yi would sit himself in between Wei Yan and Yang Yi, acting as an intermediary, passing messages between the two in order to prevent any outright conflicts or outbursts. This is also the reason why, immediately after Zhuge Liang's death at Wuzhang Plains, Yang Yi asked Fei Yi to make a visit to Wei Yan's tent in an effort to gauge Wei Yan's stance on the retreat. And thus, it was Fei Yi who first discovered that Wei Yan had no interest in retreating, as Wei Yan even tried to make Fei Yi sign a collective with him in order to order the army to continue the fight. Sensing trouble, Fei Yi immediately excused himself as he would lie to Wei Yan that he would go and help Wei Yan convince Yang Yi to continue the fight, when in reality, Fei Yi was running off to inform Yang Yi of Wei Yan's intentions to disobey Zhuge Liang's last order. What followed was the standoff between Wei Yan's forces and the main army, which ultimately resulted in Wei Yan's death. While Yang Yi would emerge as the victor in this power struggle between himself and Wei Yan, he would still become sorely disappointed when he would learn that after returning to Chengdu, that Zhuge Liang had picked Jiang Wan over him to lead the Shuhan court. This choice was particularly crushing to Yang Yi, as years ago, when Jiang Wan first joined the Imperial Secretariat as a junior secretary, Yang Yi was already a senior secretary. So in his mind, Jiang Wan was always going to be his junior. Given this political setback, he decided to vent his frustration to someone he trusted in Fei Yi, as Fei Yi stood by him in his prior conflict with Wei Yan. But during this rant, Yang Yi misspoke and went too far, as he would lament the lost opportunity to surrender the Shuhan forces over to Sima Yi after Zhuge Liang's death at Wuzhang Plains, as that would have surely landed him a high court position within the Wei court, instead of being stuck in the Shuhan court now, working under Jiang Wan. Hearing this, Fei Yi once again excused himself, as he immediately reported Yang Yi to the court, as Yang Yi's statement was nothing short of outright treason. Surprisingly, Jiang Wan showed leniency as Yang Yi was only dismissed from the court and not killed. But after Yang Yi became a civilian, he continued to spend his time condemning the Shuhan court until eventually a arrest warrant for him was issued. Fearing that his punishment would impact his family and clan, Yang Yi ultimately decided to commit suicide to end the matter on his own terms. A year later in 235, with Jiang Wan being elevated to Grand General, the position of the head of the Imperial Secretariat was entrusted to Fei Yi, who would serve in this position for exactly 10 years until the year 244, when Fei Yi would take over Jiang Wan's military roles due to Jiang Wan's declining health. This was, of course, after Fei Yi had showcased his own military talents when he helped reinforce Wang Ping during Cao Shuang's invasion of Hanzhong. And it was Fei Yi's bold plan to hike through the mountains with a small force to cut off Cao Shuang's retreat that worked brilliantly, as his presence would force the Wei army to abandon almost all their supplies during the retreat, scoring Shu Han a key victory. Then for the next eight years between 245 and 253, Fei Yi would spend his time exactly down the middle, as he would garrison for roughly four of those years in Hanzhong, while the other four he would spend in Chengdu managing the courts, as he worked double duty as both the head of the military and the courts, especially after Dong Yun's death in 246. On the military front, Fei Yi shared similar ideologies as Jiang Wan, as both of them did not believe in the northern expeditions, believing that if Zhuge Liang could not make it work, then they had no chance themselves. But with Jiang Wei constantly pushing for a western strategy in allying with the Qiang nomadic tribes within Longxi, Fei Yi did allow Jiang Wei to conduct a few probing attacks, but while under Fei Yi's reign, Jiang Wei was never allowed to have a force over 10,000 troops, as Fei Yi ultimately believed it was going to be a waste of resources. But despite this, Jiang Wei continued his attacks and showed mixed results with some minor wins and some minor losses, 
One particularly important campaign was Jiang Wei's attack on the Xiping Commandery in the year 250. The attack ultimately failed, but Jiang Wei was able to capture a Wei officer by the name of Guo Xiu, who is also known as Guo Xun, as there were two copy errors in the records of Three Kingdom, leading to confusion over his name. For the purpose of this episode, we will simply call him Guo Xiu, and he's important here because after his capture by Jiang Wei, he was sent back to Chengdu, where he would defect to join the Shuhan court and somehow rapidly climb the Shuhan ranks all the way to general of the left within just two years. Looking back through the records, it's impossible to know how Guo Xiu was able to jump to this high rank so quickly, and speculation typically follows two lines of thought. The first possibility is that Guo Xiu is actually related to the Wei Empress Dowager Lady Guo, as Lady Guo also hailed from the Xiping Commandery, where Guo Xiu was captured by Jiang Wei, and leveraging off this potential relationship, Guo Xiu was able to leap his way to the position as the general of the left. The second possibility is a bit more sinister, as it claims that other highly ranked Shu Han officials must have helped him climb the ranks. And sinister because Guo Xiu turned out to be a Wei assassin, as he repeatedly tried to use his position as the general of the left to get close to Emperor Liu Shan before ultimately giving up on this near impossible target, as there were always guards or other officials getting his way to killing the Shu Han Emperor. Then on January 1st, 253, while attending Fei Yi's New Year's Day feast, Guo Xiu finally found an opportunity, as the host, Fei Yi, who had always been the type to work hard and play harder, drank a little too much and became incapacitated at his own party. Now I say Fei Yi works hard and plays harder because he had the reputation as a fast and efficient worker, to the point that when he was the head of the Imperial Secretariat, he would often finish all the work in the morning and then spent the afternoon hosting feasts, drinking, and playing board games such as Go or Liu Bo with house guests and other officials. Now unfortunately being drunk this time at his own New Year's Day feast would cost him his life as Guo Xiu would unsheath a hidden blade from the base of his horse whip and proceed to stab Fei Yi to death. Guo Xiu would be captured and executed soon after, but Fei Yi would also die a few days later from his wounds, thus bringing an end to his reign as the head of the Shuhan court, which unofficially heralded the start of the fall of the kingdom of Shuhan. Given the curious circumstances around Fei Yi's assassination, it is only natural to speculate about Guo Xiu's motivations, but as we don't have much records on the subject, I just want to lay out the facts that we do know for certain from the records, as after Guo Xiu's assassination of Fei Yi, the Wei court, led by Emperor Cao Feng, did issue a royal proclamation celebrating Guo Xiu's loyalty to Wei and his outstanding service in assassinating the rebel Shu Grand General in Fei Yi. And for his sacrifice, his son would receive a second Marquis title worth a thousand household of tax income, which was extremely high for just a second Marquis title, in addition to a commandery lieutenant title, a thousand ingots of silver, and a thousand yards of silk. Guo Xiu would also get a posthumous temple title of Wei, which means fierce, and that is a title that was only given to Cao Chun, Yue Jin, and Zan Ba in Wei's entire history. And essentially, this was an over-the-top attempt at taking credit for what I believe was a self-motivated, opportunistic assassination attempt that the Wei Imperial Court only learned about after the fact. They're going overboard to reward Guo Xiu in an attempt to encourage copycats and to cast mistrust within the Shuhan court, as there were other defected Wei officers who were working on the Shuhan side. Either way, from all historical documents I've seen on Guo Xiu, I believe he was personally motivated to assassinate any high value targets on the Shuhan side, proven by his numerous attempts at getting close to Emperor Liu Shan, and by his eventual kill on Fei Yi. The most mysterious aspect about Guo Xiu, in my opinion, is how he actually became the general of the left, but unfortunately with nothing in the records to go on, it would just have to remain a mystery. One interesting note is that before Fei's assassination, General Zhang Yi, 
had actually warned Fei Yi about his lack of security detail, warning him to at least stay alert to the potential dangers presented by the defecting officers as historically, in the early days of the Eastern Han Dynasty, a general by the name of Chen Peng, who had helped Emperor Liu Xiu recover the Shu lands, actually ended up dying here in an assassination plot orchestrated by a defecting general. Then not long after Zhang Yi's warning, it would come true with Guo Xiu's assassination of Fei Yi. And with Fei Yi's death here, our episode and series on the Prime Ministers of Shu Han will also be coming to an end. Hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode and series enough to consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this on Three Kingdoms history, or simply support the channel by leaving a comment below or hitting that like button. And as always, I'll see you all next time. Bye!